questions I have is Jake, how does how does your what you're talking about fit with the Ginny's um, uh, what she's talking about with their work and with um, the Icarus work that Christian talked about? How does it all fit yeah. together, and how do all of the initiatives like? It's a co common thing in the conservation tech space that like there are all these individual players. How do we work together, and how do they all fit together? And as someone coming into like wildlife tracking and biologging, how do you understand the landscape and what to use and where? Jake, do you yeah, have, have a crack? It's, it's, tough. it's funny. I sat in a room with the people that like run operations on the International Space Station, and they didn't know about Arctic Risk until I I told them about it. There's just Again, because these things are such complicated bureaucracies of so many people doing so many different things, uh, uh, getting everyone on the same page is, is tough. Uh, yeah. And obviously, when, once we found the right person to talk to, they knew all about it. Um, so uh, I, I, there's an inherent challenge there that I'm, I mean, frankly, you're helping break down right now. Uh, this, this is fantastic. And I, yeah. when the speakers in front of me were talking, I'm, I was sitting here nodding my head like a big geek because uh, uh, there are things that we should all, all three of us, I'd love to talk about more. Um, as far as how my project is different, uh, you got to remember that the space station only goes overhead, um, what, six times a day? I don't know offhand. Um, so it's just a few 16. times a day uh, and, and there's a limited orbit of that. So that's one sensor. So imagine if you had 18,000 Icarus up in orbit. Uh, that's that's, that's this kind of the scale that we're talking. The, the International Space Station um, is also has a limited lifespan. You know, I, I don't think it's going to be up there for, for I don't want to knock, knock on wood. I don't want to say anything, but but it, it does well, have a plan. I think the, um, the Icarus is supposed to only, the, the project, Christian, maybe you can jump in here. I think Icarus is only supposed to be there for two years. Is that right? Yeah, so I think they, they use the um, International Space Station for, for the initial deployment, but they are then yeah. looking at launching um, other repeaters, other satellites that can can serve that function. Um, so yeah, Steph, you're right. I think it's uh, the space station is only used um, for for proof of concept uh, before the the project is being scaled up. And do you know um, one of one of the questions that came through around Icarus was like, uh, when does the system come online? You mentioned that it's being tested, and in the chat, some people were talking about some some initial tests. But when is it going to be available for um, the broader conservation users to, to participate, do you know? Hopefully very soon. I mean, that, that really is a, a question for the, the project leader, Martin Wikelski, but I know that they are testing the system. They're doing a lot of ground tests with the, the tags that don't actually rely on, on the space station antenna. Right. And, um, so they can do an awful lot with the, the tags themselves. Um, but I, I think the, the switch on is, is imminent. Um, I, I think that there will be an initial uh, testing period uh, to, to make sure that, that all the communication is, is working well. But the, the major hurdle um, of installing the antenna on the space station, that has been taken and that went well and the hardware uh, is installed and that's, um, uh, that's, that's a major, major step forward. But I, I understand that it's, it's very soon. And so going back to the original question, was, which is like, how does everything fit together and how do we work together to work together? Um, sorry, Jake's comment in the chat. Oh, <laughs> sorry, yeah, sorry that. Um, can, can I ask you, I, I, in terms of working together, uh, I, I mean, the, I don't know if there's anybody from tag companies on here, but that's part of it is that there's a scale problem. Like, like it is, I don't know, is Icarus use the same signal as Argos or does that mean that tag companies need to retool? There's part of a, like a common communications framework that I feel like we all need to need to be on. Does that make sense? Uh, Virginia, maybe you can jump in there because you are a tag company. <laughs> but actually, Argos they they had their own frequency band, so I think it's they have. So they are just nearby us because they are based based in Toulouse too. So we are just near from them and we work with them since a while now and we developed for them in 2013. So the goniometers used in worldwide and in America too, which is a, a satellite, but ground satellite kind of because it's working on the same way. And I think um, mm -hmm. Argos, it's a, actually I really believe on Argos system <laughs> because I, I, I really think um, they, they have their own 
uh, frequency band, actually. It's a private band. So I just speak about the, the object, connected object just before and all the, this narrow band that everybody is inside. And I think that we're gonna have a lot of spurious at term. So I think it's, it's perfect to be on, on private frequency band as Argos. And they plan to launch few satellites because just the problem today, it's uh, just the satellite coverage because they just, there is just six satellites. And uh, because we have to send the data to the satellite, we have to have a lot of power. It's about 300, 500 <laughs> milliwatt of power. So it's a lot compared to the field, like just 10 or one watt, so which is nothing, one milliwatt, so which is nothing. But after, so we hope that they're gonna put more satellites we're gonna just send one message instead of 10 or 20. And uh, then we can use one specific frequencies for wildlife. So I really believe in, in, in Argos system, actually. So the, the challenge there, so uh, first off, don't get me wrong, Ar Argos is fantastic. I don't wanna, uh, it, I don't wanna give any impressions that it's not. It's, it's what I rely on uh, for, for all my work. Um, there, there is sort of an inherent problem of the business model that Argos uses, right? It's a closed platform. It's, not, it's, it's a proprietary platform. So it, it's impossible to find, to get documentation on how it works. So for example, um, if you want to have an open source uh, solution uh, that is repeatable, um, uh, you have to go through, you know, the, the Argos company. So to actually scale something up to get from six satellites to something that has a huge coverage and can, have a lot more data for at that low power. Uh, I, I, is Argos really the solution? Um, you know, Argos plays a critical role as part of it, but um, but you know, again, it's six satellites, and aren't, I'm pretty sure one or two are past their usable lifespan. And these are expensive satellites. These are you know NOAA and, and, and other organizations that are these are these are big deals. Uh, so uh, so that's micro satellite came in. You know, idea came in is can we use uh, can we get? Can we take the Argos? What's, what's been so successful in Argos? But can we shift that towards an open source system that is repeatable, um, similar to sort of how amateur radio communicates, where there are hops around the world? Just one, one addition to um, Steph to to go back to your original question: how everything fits together, all these different systems. Just to, yeah. to clarify one thing about Icarus. So, the one of the the main um, um, innovations of the Icarus um, project really is by using the International Space Station, you, you have a very low orbiting vehicle that you can use for, for your uh, data relay for, for communication. I mean, the, the International Space Station is, is orbiting at about 350 or 400 kilometers, whereas an Argus satellite is, is about twice that, 800 kilometers. So because of that reduced distance, you, you need much less power to, to transmit your uh, to transmit your data, and that means these Icarus tags can be substantially smaller, and, and that is what drove initially the the Icarus vision: uh, make the tags as small as possible, um, make them ultra low power, um, and make them so small, in fact, that they can be carried by by small songbirds, and in a few years, uh, actually, uh, things like butterflies and dragonflies. Um, but that really is, is, I think, conceptually, that's um, that's the main difference um, because the space station is, is orbiting at, at such a low orbit. Uh, you can save an awful lot of energy on the, the tag and the thing that is, is sitting on the animal. That, that's so amazing. And that's, so again, with the, with the small satellites, these are going up at different orbits. So I don't know if you guys ever see, you guys know what a chuck it is, the little things that you put a tennis ball in it for your dog and it, and it whips it across the, 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 a field. Um, so, uh, the space station has uh, what's called the nano racks, which is basically a, a launcher for these small satellites. So if you're not going up into higher orbits, um, you, you can also, they also are launching uh, satellites into small Earth orbits. So maybe that's one way that Icarus and the small sat community can work together, right? Is that um, you're putting up all these small satellites in, in various orbits, but a lot of them are going into low Earth orbit and only for brief periods of time, but the sort of the Earth is always based in this network of, of small satellites. Uh, so it could be that perhaps uh, a receiver that is common with Icarus 
can uh, can bake can supplement so that not you not only have the International Space Station go ahead and you not only have your other planned receivers but you have other receivers in that same low Earth orbit so you can continue to take advantage of the of the low power angle. Uh, for us, like uh, as a producer, the only thing is that more you are nearest from the planet, narrow is actually the, the coverage on the planet. So the satellite must to, you know, like uh, cross the transmitters on the planet frequently. Mm -hmm. And actually we are speaking about moving animals. And our question is about, is it possible to get the ephemerides and almanacs often? Because actually my transmitters have to know when your satellite is coming to know when I have to send my data. And uh, so today, um, the, you know, like more you're close, what I say, more you're closer to, to the planet, narrow is your angle of, of coverage. So my question is, is a Kairos system um, crossing a uh, same point often, but how often? Because there is just one set. Actually, we say with Argos, we just six sets. We say they are not closing the hearse often, that we cannot get in, get the uh, satellite Argos cannot get them as, as often as we want, actually. So we are a bit, um, you know, like hungry about the Argos system and there is six satellites, not just one ISS. So I'm just, you know, like, I just want to know how you want to make it, actually. Because even though you say it's a low orbit, but it's like 400 kilometers from us, and Argos system is 700. So there is, it's about, you know, like 300 of kilometers of, of differences. But it's huge compared to the coverage of the, the Earth you can cover. So uh, I may, have to know that how we can do actually as a producer and transmitters, how we can know when the satellite is coming. And the only thing, um, the only thing we know and we think can work is to have more satellites and it's what they plan, 20 satellites more. So it would be 26, same as GPS almost. Mm -hmm. So it will be just amazing. Maybe I, um, so I can answer some of those questions. I, I should say, I think I haven't said that before, I, I don't hold any shares in Icarus. So um, I answer these questions to the best of my knowledge, but I'm not part of the, the Icarus team itself. Um, but you're, you're absolutely right. So I think the, the space station 16 orbits a day, and it covers a fair amount of, of uh, the Earth's surface um, during that time. Uh, the techs themselves, they, they know when, when the space station is approaching. And so they are in hibernation mode. When they know that the space station will be coming close and will be within communication range, they will switch on and they will be listening out for signals from the space station. And when it's close enough, they will establish communication. So that is another trick the Icarus system uses for um, preserving energy on, on board, on the tag. Um, it, it has this clever system where it knows when, when communication with the space station and, and data uplink is possible, uh, and it only switches on then. So there is a downlink on iCars? Yeah. Okay, so you use, so to have the downlink, my transmitters have to be on to get the downlink and to get the almanac to know when the satellite is coming. Um, That'll, that'll be a question for, for Martin and his team, but I... I, uh, but I it's always, you know, it's, it's always actually the balance between, because we were thinking about the new chipsets, the Arctic chipset from Argos, and actually we, so they send downlink, and actually we are thinking about, is it more interesting for us to keep the receiver on and waiting for the ephemeride and amanac from the satellite, know when they are coming and then send the data really when satellites are there or is it more interesting to because of autonomy yeah? it's just autonomy questions or is it more interesting for us waiting and send the data maybe <laughs> try to send the data when we think the satellite is there and it's what we are still doing there and most of them actually most of the producer are doing there so 
actually we we are you know thinking about all the time balance because what i say one of our most big limits it's about energy at the time and so for wildlife we are looking for very miniaturized tags but with miniaturization we cannot have like hundred and hundred gps fixes with just one gram tags and send every fixes on satellites it's it's totally utopic it's not possible so it's you know all the time the balance between how does it cost for me and how many data do i looking for mm -hmm. yeah. can i interrupt with a question that uh was asked a little while ago by simon taylor um I was asking you, Jake, uh, but anyone feel free to comment, um, uh, for any insight on how significant the SpaceX Starlink constellation could be for conservation. Uh, a low latency, high bandwidth connection seems like it would enable a lot of applications, especially involving image recognition, but um, on the ground station hardware sounds potentially complex. Uh, does anyone have thoughts uh, responding to Simon's question? So Jake, I, I say it says no. <laughs> uh, I, I can't. I can't specifically speak to how um, the. I, I do know that the that um, if we had a you know I, I think that something needs to be proposed to the SpaceX crew and you know there are other there are other companies doing this too right Google and and Facebook and others as well so um, I don't think there's an agreed upon solution just yet that of how these things could be leveraged for for animal conservation. Um, just that they could be. Um, Rob, do you want to jump in and ask your question? You mean me, Rob? Yes, you, Rob. And which of the 100 questions that I wrote? The aircraft mm -hmm. one? Or all yeah, of them? Uh, no, I think we've covered the aircraft one in the chat yep. sufficiently, but um, uh, you had a couple of questions around chipsets. Yeah, and open source. Yeah. yeah. So Virginie, I was, I'm late to this conversation because I'm an idiot and thought that this was happening in an hour and have been asleep. So um, I'm interested in, um, like we, we make, you know, little tags ourselves, but we just take off the shelf, you know, cheap uh, chipsets and, you know, basically try and throw together something fairly straightforward that's quite cheap and quite cost effective um i'm very interested in you know you're talking about one gram tags for example which you know is highly competitive with most of the best um tags that would be out there how open source or available is your system going to be for other researchers to sort of integrate with their own systems or will you be making these mostly commercially available oh, um, Shut up. <laughs> so um actually today so it's not fully open source data so what i mean by that is that we provide with the transmitters raw data so and raw data and, and normal data after uh, this data can be implemented on your own software some one of our customer have his homemade software and so he just put this data on his uh, application and then he made his own analysis. After we are discussing with uh, MoveBank to, to make it open source data, mm, interesting. to make it compatible, um, it's other because our uh, transmitters are fully programmable. So you can program everything. When I say everything, it's everything, everything. So the number of GPS pieces, how you want to get GPS pieces, the recurrence of Argos sending. So if you want, if you are not in the array and if you really need Argos, so for example, you can have, um, you can, you can program an Argos sending every 28 days and we really 14 days, for example, every 20 days, it's up to you. And actually that helps you to save money, for example, because you will, you won't, you know, use Argos as much. So because of that, uh, because it's typical, it's hard to implement it and to make it generics. So we are speaking with MoveBank to try the best way to make it open source data. But at that time, when you buy the transmitters, your data, the data inside is yours. 
So you can make it open source if you want. It's uh, because it's yours. Uh, we we are we don't have any actually any, any controls on your data. And about the chipsets, so the chipset I talk is a chipset um, Argos called Argos Arctic, and this chipset is not our home. It's a, it's an Argos chipset. So same, we don't have any 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 control on that chipset and on the way it it works. It's an Argos system, fully Argos. So I swear, just to, to jump in, I, I'm quite sure that Al, Alistair Davies, who I don't think, who was supposed to be here, um, uh, who was supposed to be here, but I don't think is, I'm quite sure he's working on an open source chipset with the Argos chipset, um, the, the very small. The Arctic. Yeah. Um, so uh, Rob, I would, I, we can follow up with um, with Al afterwards um, and find out more about what's happening there. I'm pretty sure it's an Australian application as well. Um, I, I think it's in partnership with Zoo Victoria, but I'm not sure. Um, but um, I, it actually brings me on to another question that always comes up um, in that open source is one way that developers and engineers and people on that side of the conservation tech uh, equation can get involved and I'd be really interested to hear from um, all of our speakers how you would as an engineer or a developer who's interested in using my skills for conservation how how to get involved what's the best way to get involved and where are the gaps and um, how as conservationists can we work better with the, the tech industry and the tech the people with the skills um, to, to help us develop new tools um, no, uh, actually some of our scientists, um, most of the development, for example, Biolock. Biolock, it's uh, one of our scientists came to us and say, I want, I'm looking for this kind of product for this kind of product. And this product can be used to, no, no, no. And we try to make it generics and then to specify to um, different customer. But at that time, we try to make it generic by by the the type of uh, technologies you put inside. Yeah. And after, so this can happen, and uh, that help us to to develop. We have a new project running by developing and less than a gram transmitters with a GPS. Actually, it's not because GPS it's private, so it's not GPS. It will be. Um, um, kind of location ground system, okay? So it would be like kind of a GPS, but on the ground. <laughs> and would be like a GPS network, but on the ground. So like this will permit us to get to have location for just less than a gram transmitters. So we already try it, it works. So we have a proof of concept already, but we will develop soon. So we hope in, in a few years. And so that same, it's a scientist came to us and say, oh, I want this kind of product. Can you do it for us? And we try to make it. Yeah. Same so with Adios and same, all, all our products are made in like this. So it's our main forces. It's we, we custom most of the product. But I think many manufacturers and many large-scale projects would be delighted to hear from um, engineers who have the technical expertise to, to make a, a contribution to further development. So, of course, you have the, the end-user base, the, the, the people who, who fit the tags to the animals, who can provide great suggestions on what is required and, and what, what we, we need for uh, getting the, the data we, we need to, to uh, conserve the animals. But um, we... Yeah, I think that there are also opportunities for people with the, the technological know-how to, to get involved and they should approach the, the manufacturers, they should approach the, the big initiatives. Um, one, one comment I, I have about um, open, open da data and open, open technology is, um, I mean, I think that is a very exciting development and it accelerates the, the whole process of, of technology use of, of data harvesting and, and data mining. But there are also cautionary notes um, about which um, uh, 
relate to the, to the fact that that makes these systems exploitable. So um, if we are thinking about the, the use of these technologies in a conservation context, um, there may be some people who, who want to snoop in on, on communication and find out where our critically endangered um, animals are. Um, so, so they can go and, and kill them and poach them. Um, and I think that is a, a question of increasing concern. And I think something that the community needs to uh, be aware of and needs to address head on. Um, because ultimately, in, in many of these applications in a conservation context, it's, uh, it's an arms race who is who's one step ahead. Um, and I think we, we definitely want to, to be one step ahead. Uh, it's a really, really valid point and one that I think at least three people um, raised um, in the discussion points. Um, uh, Jake, did you want to jump in with your experience? Like, because I think open source is one option, working directly with developers and like um, uh, tracking tag makers is another, um, but the the NASA open challenges is another one. What was the, I, I'm curious, you said 400 people were involved in the challenge um, and you had 20 really good proposals. What was the makeup of the people? Did you find it was mostly conservationists with a tech skew or person, tech person in their team? Or is it most, was it, what sort of, were you more engaging the engineer side of things, engineers? Oh, thank you. You're on, um, you're on mute. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. I was on mute. Um, so I, 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 I can't tell you any kind of official breakdown because um, uh, we haven't like compiled that yet. We literally just got all the proposals in. But from what I've seen so far, you know, it's it's a lot of engineering. It's a lot of uh, academic. Um, I think that there's a. I didn't see much from the conservation world or the animal telemetry world or anything like that just yet. Um, uh, but that could be because I just haven't come across it yet. That's um, so interesting. Yeah, I think I think what's interesting is that this is this this was a challenge unlike anything that I think NASA has done before, right? They've done uh, challenges like developing a 3D printer for the International Space Station, or uh, or what should uh, the, the the next generation of spacesuit look like, and and things like that. Um, uh, they've never done anything on like, uh, from what I from what I know, on that has such a, a, a conservation impact to it. They've done some stuff on illegal fishing uh, and data mining AIS data, um, but I think this was the first thing that they've done something from this community. And so, uh, the the majority of the proposals that I've seen um, I, I've been either uh, engineer companies or uh, academia, academia, like uh, like. Uh, uh, companies, uh, schools that have like aerospace engineering programs and things like that. Right. Um, sorry, I got a bit distracted by the chat. <laughs> um, Rob, did you want to uh, jump in? Rob Appleby, Australian Rob, did you want to jump in? Because I think it's a really nice um, point to end this little part of the discussion on um, with what you just posted. Yeah. yeah, sure. So my question to the tech companies and the people who are kind of organizing these big challenges is the little operators like us, what we tend to find is, you know, we get really excited and we go off and we build our own little platform or whatever. And then we hear about 5,000 million other people that have basically done the same thing. And they've written a paper about putting it on a rabbit in their backyard or whatever. And and so we, we get frustrated by all the money and effort and time that goes into basically building exactly the same thing over and over and over again. So my interest would be how do we coordinate a way to kind of break up the tasks? You know, maybe some of the smaller people like us can look at things like um, testing or proof of concept, you know, level stuff that can then feed back to your you know, to help you guys who are sort of at the bigger end of the scale, who have all the chipsets or who are developing the, you know, the electronics so that we're not wasting precious resources, if that makes sense. Is there anything that sort of jumps out? I saw Virginie respond with testing in harsh environments, which is an easy thing for us in Australia, uh, probably in, in a lot of cases. So 
I mean, that's a great answer. That helps me try and understand, you know, where I could spend my time more in a more worthwhile way. Are there any other thoughts or ideas on that? I, 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 I just to chime in real quick. I, I, uh, I totally share that frustration about, uh, uh, you know, going down one road and then finding out someone, you know, did something and published on it or didn't publish on it or, or whatever. Um, to me, there's, there's, there's got to be some role for organizations like Wild Labs or, or Kristen, even the, even the International Biologging Society. Uh, there's got to be where we could put people on the same page and develop a roadmap. And I mean, you're always going to have people that are reinventing things in, in, in you know, in, in stovepipes. That, that's always going to happen. Um, part of my reason for reaching out across government agencies was that across the government, let's not, let's, well, let me at least do my part of not reinventing the wheel if I can. Um, uh, but n no, nobody, no one person is in the know on everything. So maybe it's a, it's a good opportunity for organizations like Wild Labs or, or maybe, maybe at, at the International Biologging Society that, that we could develop something that, that we could all maintain a, a communication on, or I, I don't know, Christian, you're nodding. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's that's a fantastic suggestion, and I, I wonder whether as a as a starting point there could be something like an inventory um, that can grow over time, where like within meaningful <laughs> subheadings for particular technological problems, people identify existing solutions um, that are either commercially available or um, and published um, or or otherwise, um, and that that could become like an an active open document or database to, to which people yeah. add. Can I, inter people can can I interrupt? I've, I've been asked to contribute to those sort of inventories four times in the last like four weeks. So for different aspects of conservation tech, but like there are so many sitting out there that I think so, it would be such an easy thing to like combine, combine them and have them as a live um, live repository on Wild Labs that we keep updated. Like, and that was kind of partly what um, having the member directory on Wild Labs was supposed to, and how we're expanding and building it out was supposed to do because, like, so many people like you have to start from the landscape mapping every single time, and it's like, like it, it's been done so many times. So I think we should combine some effort, and we're we're working on that. We'll share it with you guys and yeah. get um, get. Uh, um, get collaboration on around that. That would be great. I mean, if, if the, the International Biologging Society can contribute on the, the biologging uh, side of things, we, yeah. we would be delighted to, to do that. Are you guys um, going to SCB next year? Um, not sure. Okay. In, Ger in, Ger uh, in Germany, you mean IMCC or the SCB? SCB. Um, oh, the, sorry. Uh, I yeah, just SCB Malaysia next year. Um, Okay. Um, yeah, we're talking about, we, we put in an application yesterday for um, a symposium around technology. I, sh I assumed okay. that there must be one around biologging. Mm -hmm. That'd be awesome. A short course as well, a one day workshop. So it could form part of that work um, that's been done um, in that space as well. There's, yeah. so, there's so much stuff to link up. It just kind of takes time really. <laughs> and like part of the purpose of these, um, these virtual web, these, the virtual meetups is to have these conversations. So I think we've only got seven minutes, uh, uh, three minutes left. I'm so sorry. Um, I think that's a kind of a really nice way to, to end it that um, like building a roadmap and building that shared space. I'm so sorry, Rob, you, you slept through most of it. Um, so, um, <laughs> um, so I think, there should be some clear like things we can follow up um, through the Wild Labs platform or through whatever communication makes sense. Like Wild Labs for us makes sense because it's open and everyone can access it and it's tapping into the broader community of conservation tech, not just the wildlife tracking people. Um, but we're certainly really keen to facilitate it. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you to our speakers. Um, were there any closing remarks that you wanted to um, uh, Talia's just dropped in um, a link to the full um, the full virtual meetup seminar series. Uh, uh, the next one's going to be on the 12th of December, and it's going to be around big data for um, for conservation. So it might pick up on some of the questions and the the data uh, the questions around standards and sharing and um, all that side of thing that came up in the discussion today. So please join if you are able to. But um, 
Uh, otherwise, does anyone have closing remarks they'd like to share? Yeah. I just, I just have a, a quick one. So you, you asked me earlier a question um, where, where I wasn't quite sure about what, what, what it was about. You, you mentioned the, the nanotax, and I didn't recognize that. So it's the motor system. And that is, you asked about the difference between the, that system and the, these um, wireless sensor networks we used on the crows. And the difference is uh, the motor system is a radio telemetry system. So it's one way. It's tagged to receiver station. Yeah. The system we used is two way. It's transceiver technology. So the, the tags communicate right. with each other, but also with base stations that can be deployed in the environment. Um, Amazing. So, is there a, did you, would you be able to drop a link to find out more or have you already done that? Uh, or is um, it in your talk, isn't it? It's in my talk, but, okay. but I can also, yeah, I, I can share uh, material with you if, if you can then pass it on. Will do, thank you. Um, Virginia, did you want to, to, to any final comments? But I just want to thank you, everybody. And actually, I would be very happy to, to share my feedback on telemetry. Uh, actually, well, what I just say to, to Rob, it's that we used to develop smaller tags and then to make them bigger. So lots of solution uh, exists in the world right now, but after it's to find its balance story. It's to find the good balance between weight, autonomy and study aim mm -hmm. and uh, which kind of, of uh, technologies can fit to everything in terms of uh, efficiencies. So this is the hard point and what we used to say to our to scientists working with us it's to share our to share their actually their dreams in terms of tags and then so we cannot do everything but we try to to make our best and now we start to have lots of um, feedbacks from uh, different species we, we had follows in terms of attachment and in terms of, for example, material, because we spoke about the te telemetry and the technologies, but another issue is about material. For example, which type of antenna are you using? Which kind of, of, um, uh, of uh, system you, you do to make it aromatics, you know? And uh, so it's different kind of, of uh, issues we encounter during the development that we can share to you because we'll be happy to share that. But there is a lot of, of things to do actually, a lot of things. And in just five years, we saw a huge gap. So for example, uh, when we developed the goniometers, just, just an idea of the size of memories, but just so the goniometers, we developed it in 2013. So now we are in 2018. So five to six years ago, actually, the goniometers had a memory of 32 million bytes. Now, with the same size, we can fit a memory of 128 million bytes. So it's just amazing. And same with GPS accuracy. So we don't use the same chipset than before. So everything is evolving and is doing very quick uh, with battery too. And we hope uh, with solar panel, we will get more um, solar array and get more efficiency soon. Actually, it's not our job. Like people who are making solar panel are doing very great for that. But yeah. we are just like crossing fingers at thinking people will make like the best and most efficient batteries and solar panel <laughs> soon. What's the best way to stay up to date with how your technologies and your offerings are uh, evolving? Uh, for, for me, sorry, could you repeat yeah. the question? Oh, uh, sorry. I, what's, where, yeah. what's the best way to stay up to date with how, do you do a state oh, of uh, the best technology? Uh, sorry. UHF, I think. Yep. The, the huge will be more about UHF. We did like, so there is a memories, but I think in UHF now, so components are more little. Sorry, sorry, my question was, was how do, so you've got so much knowledge yourself yeah. and in your organization, how do we best tap into that and hear what's, how do we stay on top of what you're working on and what's coming up in the future? Uh, we stay on top because of other projects, because we still, we work on, on wildlife, but we still develop other projects. For no, no, no. 
<laughs> I'm so sorry, I'm not being clear. As a conservationist, if someone outside, yeah. how do we understand what you're working on and what's coming down the line? How do you communicate outwards? Oh, okay. Um, I actually just have as because we don't really communicate a lot about the, the coming project because they are coming and so we, we are speaking more about you know the real project so project already okay but um, if you want to know about what you are doing it just send us a mail it will be easier any function of what you are looking for we can you know like tell you how we're, where we are and as I told you before, so we are developing other uh, projects in other domain, which help us in conservation. Yeah. So it's maybe today it's not about conservation and wildlife, but could be because the technology could be used. Yeah. Not because the application is not the same that the technology cannot be used in that application. Um, well, thank you so much for, for bringing your expertise into this, this, um, this discussion. It was really, really interesting. Um, I learned a lot. Um, I, I think I speak for a lot of people. Um, and Jake, any closing remarks from you? Uh, nothing really too profound. This was really uh, enjoyable. Uh, thanks so much for, for pulling all these people together. Um, I certainly uh, got a lot out of it and I, I appreciate the opportunity. So, um, so thanks, thank you. I'm delighted that I randomly found you on Twitter and <laughs> we connected. Um, <laughs> um, thank Thank you uh, to all our speakers and to, thank you to everyone who's um, remained in the chat as well. Um, it's been uh, wonderful and we'll pick up, we'll um, share our notes and key takeaways from, the, from this meetup and we'll pick up some discussions and the, the roadmap and the, the things that sort of emerge where we could be pushing things along and being um, kind of mapping things and uh, collaborating, helping facilitate collaboration. So. Um, look for a follow-up from us um, and uh, we'll speak Thanks to, to you and Wild Labs for, for organizing this. Um, pleasure. Yeah, that, that was a really great, great thing and I think it, it shows how, it shows the, the strength of the community when, when people are pulling together and are willing to collaborate. Um, uh, I think that's a great initiative. I, uh, I tell you what though, we, we thought there would be 20 people um, the first time we launched and then we had 150 like apply for this one. So we're clear, there's clearly a demand for, like people want to talk to each other and um, collaborate and it's such a fun part of working in this job that Talia and I get to tap into. So um, thanks everyone. We'll leave the chat open for a few more minutes in case you want to say goodbyes, but otherwise um, we'll speak to you all soon. Bye.